Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. First and foremost, I would like for you to meet my good friend, Adam Golden from Mental Watches. I did a collab with him sometime in the past where we talked about a few vintage pieces. That was a video where he actually sold me a brigade, which I still have and enjoy. Thank nice. you for that. But uh, in a nutshell, what happened was, is I called Adam, I was like, Adam, I got a 15, 18 paddock. He's like, holy <laughs> Roman, this is my grail watch. Oh, I'm <laughs> jumping on a plane. He lives in Florida. So, you know, he said, I'm jumping on a plane. I want to talk about this paddock 15, 18. So what I did is I brought the paddock 15, 18, which you see here, this is your holy grail paddock out there, right? Wouldn't you say yeah. that that's the paddock to own? I'm going to let Adam talk about this paddock because not only is this the holy grail of all paddocks when it comes to vintage stuff, this is also Adam's favorite vintage watch. Am I right? Absolutely. So, Adam, First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for allowing me to uh, do this with you. And yes, I am very excited about this watch. Congratulations on acquiring it. This watch, hands down, is one of my favorite of all time. Uh, it's one of the most important watches of all time. Uh, and certainly one of the most adorned watches by collectors of all time and collectible watches of time. So why is that? The 1518 was produced uh, 1941 to 1954. And to give a little context, uh, this watch was made by Patek Philippe during the throes of World War II. So not a lot of people were really concerned with high, you know, hot horology at the time and fine watchmaking. It wasn't really a, a big deal because everybody was worrying about the war. Uh, but at the time, Patek Philippe was like, damn that and we're going to make some great watches they made at the same time the very first perpetual calendar watch and they made the 1518 which is the first perpetual chronograph watch that was made in production so it was the first serialized uh, perpetual chronograph perpetual calendar chronograph watch um they made around 281 examples, allegedly, of them. I love how and, you said around 281 examples. Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's what they report. Patek Pretty Philippe, bad. actually, from all the other brands, uh, at least compared to Rolex, for example, does keep very accurate records, and they give their clients access to it. So we know that they made 281 examples. Who knows how many have actually survived since these were made in the 40s and 50s to this day. Um, they're, most of them were made in yellow gold, as you see here. There were some made in rose gold, uh, some made in steel, I think four examples known in steel and then apparently although none have surfaced to the market uh, so far in platinum and also two-tone um, but yeah really exciting watch um, if you don't know what a perpetual calendar is it's very simply a calendar watch it shows the day of the week uh, date month and also has a moon phase and the cool part about it is that once you set it as long as you keep it wound it does not need to be set until uh, from now 2100 or however you say that, <laughs> yeah. for another 80 years. Um, yeah. You only have to reset that because of the leap year but I hope in 80 still, I hope we're still here in 21. Right, to be able to, to yeah. see it. So, and also, you know, given that it also has all the calendar functions, you could also time an event with the chronograph function. So it was the first of its kind. Another watch similar to this wouldn't be made for so 50 years. Um, they really owned the game. Uh, like you said, it's the holy grail. Um, these are, you know, for a must for any serious Patek collector, and every serious one has one. Uh, it's my personal grail. I hope to one day own one in my personal collection. I've been fortunate to sell it's, a couple it's, of them. It's for sale. <laughs> you want, you want, <laughs> we'll talk buy. after the show. <laughs> right. um, so, yeah, it, it's a really special watch. Uh, the one you have actually happens to be in beautiful condition. You know, it's a very honest watch. Um, it's been worn and loved throughout the years, but the dial is very clean, uh, very legible, uh, has the raised enamel. It, it's it's a really beautiful watch. And for me, since I have smaller wrists, they fit perfectly on the wrist. A lot of, Same. Yeah, a, a lot of modern collectors only like these bigger, bigger watches, but this is how they did it back in the day. This is what a man wore, or a woman. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, the the watch to own for Patek Philippe. So I guess the next question that, that my audience always want to know, you know, I'm very transparent on my channel. I always talk numbers and things of that nature. Now, this is a type of watch where, you know, would you say uh, auction results are a good indicator to figure out a value on this? Or do we still go back to the good old ways where us, the dealers, based on condition and things of that nature, we set a value on a watch like this? Well, like any vintage watch, it's all very, very, very uh, condition heavy. You know, so the higher, the better condition watches, just like an art with cars or any collectible, are going to command bigger premiums. Uh, but this is a reference that, you know, for one, actually plays close to the vest in terms of auction prices and, and, and retail prices from a dealer like you or I. Uh, the prices that they command in auction are similar to what you'd have to pay from a dealer to get them. 
uh, because they are so rare. And if you look on the market, I don't know if there's any for sale right now. I haven't checked. Whereas there but is I, one now. But I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there may be only one other for sale. So if you're out there in the market for one, you have to kind of play by whoever uh, has it, their rules, uh, because you really don't have a lot of options. I feel like those private collectors that buy them, that's a watch that just stays with yeah, them. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It just, it just doesn't absolutely. leave. Absolutely. So uh, give me a past auction result. So they, I mean, they've been trending upwards for the past 10, 15 years, you know, they used to be able to be bought, you know, 200,000, 250,000. I think for a good example like this, you're paying anywhere from 400 to 500,000 now for it. Uh, obviously, if you're talking about a rose gold example, it's more money closer to a million uh, steel. The sky's the limit. I think the last one in auction sold for $12 million, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, um, Ian, crazy money. Can we Photoshop this real <laughs> quick? Make the stainless steel. <laughs> it'll, be a lot more, it'll be a lot more money. Listen, if you have a stainless steel one, not only am I flying to do a video, but I'm gonna stay with you a week just so I could wear it on my wrist walking around your house and, and, and all that, like that, that would be the penultimate right there. So, so there you have it, boys and girls. This is Adam's take on the Holy Grail paddock, which I'm very, very excited to have in my office. I believe I bought it right based on Adam's numbers. The passion behind the conversation we just had, you can almost feel it, at least I felt it. Hopefully you guys felt that on camera, well, but- We're converting you, you know? Yeah, slowly, slowly but surely, yeah, slowly yeah, right? Surely. You can be both, he sold, you know? he, he sold me my first vintage Blanc Pond. He sold me my first vintage Breguet, uh, along with a few other Rolexes and things of that nature. So, you know, I am slowly but surely, I'm not being converted, I'll tell you why, because I love all watches. Yeah, you know, I, exactly. I will gladly put on a $200 watch and a $2 million watch just the same, so long as I love that watch. Absolutely. That's what I always preach. Uh, let's talk about something else, and this is another thing. Obviously, Adam brought a gazillion dollars worth of watches with him because he's got to show how big his eggplant is anyway. But <laughs> regardless of the fact, uh, I did want him to I did want him to talk about another watch that I recently bought. And this is a watch, hold on, let me get it on camera. Here we go. So this is a watch that was made for the Italian military. I will say no more. Some of you guys may know what this watch is. is. You've seen it in auction. And this is more of a younger watch, a more of a modern timepiece, but it brings up a topic of Rolex and their collabs with other companies, yes. which is so rare that it's ridiculous. So Adam, if you can give you a five minute spiel on another watch that I wanted you to talk yeah, about, it's interesting mine, that you, get into yours. It's interesting that you pulled this out at the same time I actually just listed on my website a Comex watch, which we'll get to in a second. This watch was made in 2008. There were 78 examples made. It is nicknamed the Polipetto, which is Italian for small octopus. If you look closely at the dial, there's a small octopus. How do you say big octopus in Italian? Uh, you know, you're gonna have to ask somebody okay, else for that fine. one, unfortunately. Yeah, throw it up on the screen. I'm uh, sure we can translate it. So yeah, it was made for the Polizio di Stato to commemorate the 50 years of the Italian uh, police navy. Um, it is one of the only times other than Comex uh, that, that, that Rolex has done a collaboration with somebody to brand their watches, which they almost never do. I'm not talking about a retailer signature like Tiffany & Co or Cartier or anything like that. I'm talking about actually designing a watch for an organization, which they literally never do. They don't ever feel the need to do it. They have the logo dials like for a lot of the uh, those oil were, companies, Middle East, but it's not but a true those were added out. after by those companies to exactly. give us gifts. These were made production by Rolex. Right. And that's the difference. That's why I asked, said that what I said. So yeah, this was made in 2008. It's a little newer, uh, but it is a very, very special watch. Very, very collectible. Uh, again, 78 pieces were made. Uh, they were given and sold directly to people of the Polizia di Stato. And coming by them is extremely hard. And, and, and like I said, back. yeah, you should. So let's see if we can zoom in the back of this here. Uh, let's see. There you uh, go. You can kind of see what's all back there. Yeah, it's engraved on the back, Polizia di Stato, um, commemorating 50 years from 1958 to 2008. Uh, really special watch, and interesting that you pulled that out at the same time where I brought to talk about uh, a Comex branded watch. So Comex was a French, and it literally translates to expert marine company, um, a French diving company that did underwater engineering, uh, diving, you know, excavation, stuff like that, explorations. Uh, and they also commissioned Rolex or partnered with Rolex in the 1970s to create watches that their divers could use that would stand the pressures of deep sea diving. Um, so Rolex produced uh, several references, branded Comex uh, from the Submariner and Sea Dweller line. Um, very, very, this was during the 70s and 80s. Uh, very, very rare watches now to surface these days and obviously very highly collectible. Uh, few have survived and fewer, fewer so have survived yeah, in good Rolex, condition. Rolex, you know? Rolex was always a tool watch and this was, right. this this was, was the true definition true of a tool watch because they made it as a tool for these divers. Mm -hmm. Now, 
the Comex just recently uh, fetched five hundred and nineteen thousand. Five thirty, yeah. Five thirty for off, a Submariner. For a Submariner, right? We recently sold a Comex. We won't mention for how much, uh, but that one was an older one. Which one was that? No, it was actually around the one that's fetched five thirty was a reference sixteen eighty Submariner. What was the um, one that, was, that we sold? We also sold a sixteen eighty. Submariner. But that one <laughs> was, that, was that older? No, it's actually around exactly. the same time. Around the same the time. The interesting th part about our watch and the 1680 Comexes, which is, happens to be the rarest Comex version, they only produce around 70 of them allegedly, uh, is that those watches were actually sold to their executives or given to their executives. They weren't actually used by divers. For the 1680 specifically, the one that we had actually was, it was used by a diver, it was sold, the papers were issued to the diver, he was uh, a war hero. Um, and there was a ton of provenance, so it was a great and watch. And, and, and as far as this, uh, pro he mentioned provenance and a ton of paperwork. These watches, what makes them so much more desirable, I feel like, and so much more appealing is the provenance that they come right. with. They literally were assigned to a diver. Now you have like all the paperwork with this one as well. Right. We'll pop in some pictures, Ian, if you could pop in the picture of all the provenance on this stuff. It comes with diving records, right. it so comes this, with- Yeah, this watch was owned by a French diver who was very well regarded and esteemed, he had money, many diving records for working on the Panama Canal. Uh, he was known to be able to hold his uh, breath and work underwater for extreme, you know, extreme amounts of time. And, and he depths. also had a kick-ass mustache. He had know. a very kick-ass mustache. <laughs> you got to put a picture of that <laughs> up because he had an epic, epic mustache. I actually posted on Instagram and everybody was commenting, look at the mustache. Look, look, forget so, the watch, right? Look right, at the forget the watch. It's by for the mustache. Let's talk numbers because, again, my guys and girls want to hear numbers in terms of values and things like that. So this particular example, and then it's going to bring us into the topic of condition of watches and values based based on that, which is why a lot of these other watches are here. But let's talk about so this So the two watches that we have, the Polizia di Stato and the Comex, uh, the market's pretty settled via auction results. Uh, these don't change hands often enough privately. I, I, they do, uh, but they sell a lot more often at auction. Um, with your watch, uh, it's pretty well established um, from the various ones that are sold in the auction that they sell in the 120 to 140,000 range. Uh, for the Comex, it really depends on the reference. Like I said before, there's a variety of references that they used for these Comex watches. This one happens to be a 1660, uh, triple six they call it. Um, they sell anywhere from let's say 60 to 120,000 uh, depending on the condition, the provenance, the paperwork. This one's a, a full set with full provenance. It recently sold in auction for, I wanna say 105 or 110 after fees uh, were included. Um, you know, which is in line with the market. Uh, if this was a matte dial, uh, so this is called a gloss dial. You can see with the white gold surrounds, and if you uh, were able to see closer, the surface of the dial is glossy and has a lacquer finish. Well, you have a matte dial that you brought out for everybody to see uh, that was produced around the same time, which is the predecessor to that watch. Um, so you can see the dial. They call it a flat dial. Sometimes it has a flat matte finish. Uh, this was produced in the early 80s before they transitioned to the gloss dial. Um, a CDLR Comex matte dial 666 recently just sold an auction. I'm talking like a month and a half ago. Uh, and it's more rare. Uh, granted, it's more rare. It just sold, I think, in, in a French auction for 160000 Uh Because of the rarity uh, and the exclusivity, and generally matte dials are, are favored by collectors. They are produced less. And a, and a non-comex in such in such condition, we're talking about trades at what? In the mid to high teens. And this is one of the biggest reasons I wanted to have Adam here and bring some of these watches, which seemingly look the same, to sort of shine a little bit of light into while you're out there shopping for watches in general, especially vintage watches, know what you're getting, understand the difference. You go on Adam's website, any other platform, and you see, let's let's start with GMTs, right? So I'm going to pull these guys back to the side. Make sure I don't drop them off the table. And I'm gonna pull up a bunch of GMTs, right? And you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, Roman, these seemingly all look the same. Why is Adam's left, left side listing one for a dollar, one for $4, and one for $10? What's going on here? And this is where the understanding comes in. And I asked Adam, I said, bring some watches, just show us a few good examples and talk pricing. And it's the minute, tiny little differences. They make all the difference when it comes to price. And also at the same talking, we can talk about the fact that you can have the same exact watches with the same exact dial, same exact bezel, and the price difference can still be $10,000 there's a reason for that and as you said earlier condition 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 is right. what it's about so these are three of the reference 1675 gmt masters which was probably their longest running vintage production it was from like 1960 to almost 1980 uh so you have very widespread and within that 20 year period they produced a variety of 
the same watch with little differences, upgrades, uh, details that obviously separate from each other and collectors, you know, uh, because of the exclusivity, the rarity, uh, and like you said, condition, uh, favor one over the other and leads to a, a big uh, disparity in price. Um, so let's start from the end here, uh, which happens to be the earliest one. We have what's called a uh, PCG, which stands for Pointed Crown Guards. Uh, you can see the crown guards here are pointy as opposed to the later, uh, sorry, this one. It's hard to do this. Shoulder crown guards, which we'll get to in a minute. Um, but anyways, going back real quick, uh, we have a PCG exclamation. The exclamation refers to the solid line going around the edge of the dial. Uh, exclamation dial, uh, chapter ring, exclamation dial, and the exclamation refers to that little dot right there. And that's yeah, when we get into the little this, nitty gritty this, details. This gets so, this, these guys get so geeky. Right, like, we, like, get, like we they do, have, we they get actually, very geeky actually about the it. the ones that came up with this, that right. exclamation dial. Rolex didn't come up with this, you know, so this, oh wait, so, this six o'clock marker looks like an exclamation point. So the PCG dial. cases were produced from uh, 1959 to about 1964. Uh, the chapter ring dials from 1959 to 1963, 64. Um, within these chapter ring dials, you have a few different variations. You have the regular with no exclamation mark. You have the exclamation mark. You have the underline. Uh, and, and what these dials do is they differentiate the watches. Rolex never releases information quite like Patek Philippe does or other brands. They won't tell us exactly why they did these on the dials. Common conjecture uh, specifically for exclamation and underline dials is to uh, signify that they were transitioning from radium to tritium or a less uh, a less strong, uh, you know, not as strong compound of radium, because uh, these watches were used, uh, were using radium in the late 50s, early 60s, uh, and that was right around the time when people started getting, uh, you know, hip to the fact that radium was not good for you. Uh, so they started experimenting with different lume compounds uh, to make them less radioactive, um, and they would use different things on the dial to signify that. Um, so they were produced, you know, specifically exclamation and underline dials. They were only produced for a certain transitional year, uh, which is why they are rarer and more exclusive because you could only find them, for example, in a 1962 batch or something like that. Uh, and then, you know, like you said before, it, it's all about condition, which is the great equalizer. Even putting rarity aside, uh, it all comes down to how nice the watch is. You know, for example, this watch has a absolutely gorgeous gloss style. Um, Oftentimes, these, that gloss wears off over time, so it's right. very hard it's, to find it's them. It's a clear, that thin coat of lacquer uh, that wears off, or they get these small hairline scratches. Uh, basically, any flaw, it's like having a scratch on a car. You know, it, it affects the you know the original paint. It affects I, it. I, you I, know? Talk, I talked about. Sorry, interrupt. But I talked to. Um, my clients in regards to uh, you know production numbers. Rolex made gazillions and gazillions of watches, but when you get into vintage, literally if you take a pool of a million watches, right, and the minute you mention things like, oh, well this was a transitional model only made for one year, it just goes whoop. Right. And then you say, well, the, uh, the dial, uh, is still glossy. It didn't lose its gloss, right? It's not. It didn't turn matte. I right. guess you can call that. That that shrinks it even more. Right. Then you're talking about condition of the case, condition of the bezel, the important things in that watch, and that shrinks it down to almost nothing. Right. And that's where the value goes up. I feel like. So then, yeah. So uh, absolutely, everything you said is 100% correct. So, as rare as this watch is, moving on within a year period, they changed the dial up, and this specific one, why this goes from a $50,000 watch to a $100,000 watch, is that. That this dial is only found you know in a certain year and even within that year they didn't make a lot of them so they transitioned still the same case um, they didn't transition until about a year or two after that in 1965 to a regular shoulder case uh, they still had the pointy crown guard case but if you notice the difference in the dials this one we call an open chapter dial it doesn't have that solid line going around that chapter ring uh, but what makes this watch special, and again, yeah, it's geeky stuff, but you know, this, this, this is, uh, you know this, is, this is what we love. Um, the special part about this watch in particular is what collectors call a double Swiss underline. It's arguably the rarest GMT variant that you could find. I, I, I mean, it is. I mean, it is. I mean, I, me being a novice vintage guy, I know that that's, that's the dial. That's so, uh, yeah, so it does, instead of having the exclamation, it has an underline on the dial. You can see right here a little, a little line. Let's see if we can zoom uh, in. That, on that, that again shows closer. Rolex's transition so from so Rolex to uh, so from radium to right, right tritium. Down here. Right. See what it says, Swiss. Right. Yeah. And then, like with stamps and baseball cards, sometimes uh, a misprint is 
makes you know the Carter stamp more valuable. Exactly. It's the same thing with the watch. They have on this watch what they call double Swiss. I, I don't know if it's going to be easy to show on the camera, but you see the Swiss designation at the bottom. You can see right under it a second one, uh, which again only found hence on, double Swiss. Right, hence why it's called double Swiss. This watch with this same dial without the double Swiss underline. Uh, takes the watch from a hundred thousand dollar watch back down to a thirty thousand dollar watch. I always said that like vintage watch collecting is for the humble, because oftentimes you know you see guys out there show up at a get together and everybody's bringing some fancy Richard Meals or some big watches, and you have the one vintage guy in the corner that seemingly has oh an old S Pepsi or an old S GM, uh, Coke GMT, and. It's little details like that. If somebody like myself and Adam walk into the room and recognize that that's a double Swiss dials, all of a sudden we know this guy gets mad respect right. because he's one of a hundred thousand. He knows what he's, he knows what he's got. Odds you know? are he's one of a hundred in the room that actually knows that. that. Actually so so knows I kind of I always say that it's like a lot of this collecting is for the humble. Right. And then what is the so the last one, 1967, 1968, they transitioned from these nice glossy gilt dials with this gilt inlay text to a matte dial. Where am I pointing? Right here. Uh, they ran from 67, 68, all the way up to 1980. Uh, and there were five different dials that were used. They called five executions, MK1, MK2, and so forth. Um, the prices are usually pretty stable uh, within those executions, and it really depends on the condition. But then you have one execution, which is this one right here, the MK3, also known as the radial dial, which, uh, again, causes another $10,000 discrepancy. Uh, it was produced only for a certain serial range for a couple years, and the difference between this dial is if you see, look at the loom plots, they are pushed further into the dial, giving it a radial circular look, whereas all the other executions have the loom plots uh, directly touching the hash marks. Again, it's another thing where it's subtle, uh, but for you those don't that, know. Well, well, for those that know, no. And so what is right. this trade for with this? So uh, a regular 1675 matte dial will run you anywhere from, let's say, 10000 to 18000 depending on condition. Assuming no box and papers, we're just talking regular watch. Um, this one trades in the mid to high 20s. Just and, because of that. And I, I've always talked to you guys about box and papers and things of that nature and to say that, you know, a lot of these collectors, they want the stuff out there with box and papers. But 99 out of 100 times, those box and papers yeah. are non-existent because, again, this was treated as a tool. Same way you would buy a drill today, throw out the packaging then and not think twice about it. Yeah, abs absolutely 100% correct. Yeah, and the these same were, thing, vintage toys is the same thing right now. You know, collectors want that stuff box with the original boxes, packaging. but odds right. are you never find that. Like, you know, I have three kids. I have a ton of toys in my house. I certainly don't have boxes for them. Yeah, so if you bought one of these watches, for example, from the early 60s while stationed overseas, uh, unlikely you kept the original box and papers because you didn't need it. It cost you $300 from, you know, the canteen. Uh, it, it just wasn't necessary. Rolex was not a luxury brand. At the time, you know, you had uh, Patek Philippe, like we saw the 1518 before, Vacheron Constantine, yeah. uh, who, who Adam Arpigay. Who, who knew, Those right? were the luxury brands. Rolex have, was I a tool a, watch. Yeah, in my collection, you know? I have a vintage watch with papers from uh, uh, PX, uh, right. which is an, uh, an army shop, right? Uh, it was appealing to me because I'm ex-military, so I bought it. And the fact that it had papers, and it was a Navy, it was it was a Navy guy that bought it. And I bought it from Mark, right. actually. And the fact that the paper said, you know, US Navy something or other, I forget what the PX number was, right. that made it that much more appealing to me and it also made the watch that much more valuable. But Absolutely. odds are, every GI out there that bought himself a Rolex, they threw the stuff out. They're not putting that in their backpack while they're right. out there. Right. Let's move on to a couple of other pieces and I'm gonna slide the GMTs over this way. Let's talk. We're about gonna keep the 1518 over here, though. You got you just facing at me. So let's talk about <laughs> let's talk about these guys. So yeah, it's similar regard. I brought a couple Submariners to show uh, the same concept. You know, where essentially the same looking watch, but vastly different, and for collectors, right, completely look, different. Look, I'm looking. I'm looking at the monitor right because we have a we have we have a monitor here where we line up these watches. So so can... these are the exact same reference reference five five zero eight. They nicknamed this the James Bond Submariner, the Small Crown Submariner. Well, uh, you know they have these were before Rolex made the Crown Guards covering uh, the Crown. Um, these were both produced, you know, uh, in the, around the same time. Uh, this one is 1958. This one is 1962. Um, but over that four-year period, Rolex changed and tweaked the watch, uh, and they are completely different for collectors. And you know, depending on what you're looking for as a collector, they cost different amounts. Um, so we'll start with the earlier one, 1958. Uh, the big part about this one uh, that people need to understand is the bezel insert. Not even the actual bezel. Uh, the actual little just piece of black uh, that's inside here, this circular piece, um, the bezel insert, 
Uh, why it's so special, I'm tilting it forward so you can see the very top of it. It's what is called a red triangle insert. So these inserts were only used on it for a two, three year period. Um, they were obviously uh, over the years damaged and discarded and Rolex would replace them with a more standard looking bezel like this one. Um, and so finding them for your 1958 Submariner these days has become almost impossible. Uh, to buy just the insert on the open market, depending on the condition of it, you're looking at anywhere from twenty to $50,000. And this is, just not, this for is a how nuts piece. it gets. Well, I mean, you also have to understand this insert, for example, works on certain big crown references that could be half a million dollar watches. So say you have a half a million dollar watch that you just paid two fifty four dollars with the wrong insert, um, you're absolutely going to spend $50,000 on an insert to increase yeah, but, your cost but, but, but of 300000 Right, uh, you increase your cost at 300000 but now the watch is complete and is worth more money as a result. And this brings up a good topic, and this is where I talked about in the past briefly. Notice how Adam freely talked about the fact that, hey, you buy yourself a watch with the wrong insert and you get out there and get the right insert. And a lot of people miss, I guess a lot of people misunderstand that as putting a watch together. No, absolutely It not. is putting a watch together technically, but what you're doing is you're replacing an original part that came with that watch. You have to understand something, a bezel insert or a bezel for that, or a crown on any vintage model, so long as it's the right crown, right. to the right reference, from the right time, you're not doing anything. When I think of watch. putting together a watch, I think of somebody completely assembling a piece of fiction, something that never existed before. Now, if I had bought this watch without this red triangle insert, because it was replaced by Rolex, you know, right. because it got damaged, and I was able to find an original one and restore it back to its former glory. It's like restoring a car. The watch, yeah, exactly. The watch is all correct, all original with original parts, and it's probably how it was when it left the factory. If anything, it's a bonus. It's absolutely not putting together a exactly. watch. It's the, like a completely the, uh, different put it, story. Putting put it together, Frankenstein is putting together right. parts onto a watch that, right. that never existed. Right, exactly. It's taking a back of a watch that carries serial numbers from a different watch and slapping it all right. together. If, right. If, you know, you bought the movement separately, the dial separately, exactly. the bezel, and you put together something that's that Rolex a Frankenstein never produced. Watch. That's, exactly. that's so a different this, story. This, this, so it's common practice to get out there and find these replacement cars, much like with antique cars, where if you're out there restoring an antique car and you're an original bumper, just because you put on a bumper that didn't originally come with that particular car, nobody knows that, nor does it really matter. So long as it's right. all original to the watch from the right era and not a fake aftermarket Absolutely. something. Or other, 100%. then this is perfectly fine, and this is what I wanted to put across, and I'm glad you brought that up. So let's, right. so, talk, yeah, let's it, talk about listen, some numbers in the here. Same, well, in the same vein, really quickly, uh, so 1958, 1962, Rolex transitioned to a different bezel without the red triangle, and even though the dials are almost identical, they have different levels of radiation, as we learned earlier. I can tell because that has the well, yellow hue. And, well, and it also has the little exclamation dot, so we can tell that they started transitioning to a uh, you know less strong uh, compound of radiation. Um, and you guys so, actually check that when you buy these watches. Yeah, yeah you have, we have you, Geiger uh, counters. These guys, they, 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 they walk around with Geiger counters, literally measuring radiation of a watch. And the first time I saw it, I was like, what the hell are you doing? It's, it's important. It's, yeah. it's important because they, they measure because a lot of times they could tell what, if the dial was redone? Yeah, sometimes it dials over the ages. So uh, again, like we were talking about earlier, these were tool watches that were purchased for a few hundred bucks. So if you damaged your 1958 Submariner in 1970 and you took it to a watchmaker in 1970, it wasn't worth, you know, the 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars worth it. It was still worth a few hundred bucks. No one cared. Uh, so you damaged part of it or the loom fell off or it wasn't glowing anymore, you know, in the dark, uh, they would reapply it. You know, they would redo it. It was not a big deal. It was not considered damaging the watch or devaluing the watch because the watch had no value. But today it does. Um, so today, yeah, you know, it's like, again, like old art, cars, you know, guns, anything, uh, condition matters and originality matters. Um, and that's why it's not necessarily a bad thing to have a watch that was restored, but the premium put on unrestored original pieces uh, is, you know, that much higher. It's the same, it's the same thing with vintage guns. I have guns dating back to the early 1800s. So in fact, I have guns dating back to colonial times, right? Uh, you take a, uh, use the Smith & Wesson, I just showed you, the, uh, you know, the gun that used the first bullet ever made in case bullet, right? It's, right. A, it's a model, one from 1847. So you can buy that gun, you can go on Gunbroker and buy that gun for 500 bucks. Right. The one I have is about 6,500 bucks. Right. Why? Because the condition is 80% plus. Right. So we're talking about a 170 year old right. gun. If I took a gun for 500 bucks, in today's technology, I can restore it to look brand spanking new. The value of that gun will still be seven, eight hundred bucks because right. it's not original to this time. Yeah, and it's interesting you talk about condition because you you were about to ask me about the values. Now, ordinarily, the earlier watch with red triangle bezel would be worth more, and it usually is. Um, but again, like I said earlier, condition is the great equalizer. 
Uh, while this watch is in great condition, the case has been lightly polished over the years. Uh, the dial, I don't know if you can see it, has a little uh, what they call spidering to the lacquer, even though it's super glossy and attractive. Um, and uh, this watch, on the other hand, has an unpolished case where you can see the original bevels, uh, or if it was polished, it was very, very lightly. And the dial is absolutely flawless with no scratches or spidering or cracking to the lacquer. Um, and that's something obviously that collectors are looking for. So ordinarily, if the condition of these two were absolutely equal, the earlier red triangle uh, 5508 would be worth more. Uh, but in this case, this one is a slightly more expensive watch. How much, Adam? How much? So How much? the red triangle... So do we do a drum roll or what? No, no, no. <laughs> so the red triangle is, uh, I think it's listed on my website for fifty six dollars or $57,000, uh, whereas this one is a $75,000 watch. That's crazy. And now, had this dial been in the condition of this dial, what would this be well, worth so for the red triangle? Good, good question. So one of these sold in Phillips auction in true new old stock condition to a legendary watchmaker still living today. He was the winning bidder for $500,000. Whereas one of these in like new old stock condition sold, I think a year later in Phillips also for 125,000. It's a huge difference. So it's a huge difference. I don't think $500,000 is the real market for it, but certainly it could be a quarter million dollar watch in true perfect, perfect, perfect condition. Uh, I think that was just a couple people getting carried away in the auctions, but. Speaking of rare watches, Adam, what are you wearing? I am wearing an. At first, when I looked at it, I thought, oh, wait a minute, is he wearing an Explorer or is he wearing a Submariner? So I'm wearing a Submariner that was produced right after that 625508. This is already after Rolex incorporated crown guards to the watch. Um, it looks like an ordinary Submariner, but the special part about this one and, uh, you know, collectors who are or Submariner fanatics will immediately recognize is that it has what's called an Explorer dial. So the Rolex Explorer featured a dial that had uh, markers that had 369 on them. Submariner so never really did that, but they did uh, on very few occasions. You could find them on the reference 5513 or 5512 or earlier big crown references. Uh, there's not a lot about out there. Um, they were, a lot of them were destroyed over the years, finding nice ones is, is next to impossible. Um, but it's like the holy grail of, of Submariner collecting because, you know, for every 10,000 Submariners, maybe you'll find one with an Explorer dial. So two questions for you. Let's talk value-wise. What is this watch worth? So these watches range anywhere from, let's say, 80,000 up to 300,000, depending on the condition. Uh, this one particular, uh, be completely frank, um, is has seen better days. It's really attractive, but it is, you know, worn and used and pre-loved. Um, I have pre loved. This, I love that one. No, listen, it's, it's an honest watch. <laughs> it's an honest watch. It has a little bit of loom missing right here. Uh, you know, the dial is a little speckled. It's, you know, been aged over the years. Uh, it's a really attractive example. Um, it's not a quarter million dollar watch. It's a $90,000 watch. Well, you know, and sometimes an honest watch is not a bad thing. Uh, you know, not saying that they're all, you know, there's obviously a lot of scapegoating and rumors over the vintage world that a lot of watches are touched and, you know, put together. Uh, and sometimes when a watch is perfect, it is too good to be true. Not always, but sometimes it is. Something to look uh, out for, You know, an honest watch, you know, is not a bad thing. That means it's, you know, it's original. Uh, you know, it has its condition flaws, but it was used and worn the way it was supposed to. I had a collector recently contact me about this watch and he says, listen, I love it. And I love the fact that, you know, for an Explorer dial, obviously $90,000 is a lot of money, but for an Explorer dial, it's accessible because if you wanted to wait and find a perfect one, which by the way might take 10 years um, until it comes to market, he's going to spend a quarter million. You know. So let me ask you so, a question: How does one know that that dial actually belonged to that watch? You, as a dealer, how do you know? It there's a small serial range for the Explorer dials, so it fits within that serial range. Uh, obviously, it's it's plausible that somebody found this dial loose and put it into that exact correct serial range. There's no way to ever know. Oh, it's very unlikely just because finding this dial loose, by loose I mean, you know, uh, freely for sale separately, uh, you won't. It just, you, you, won't, you, you, won't find you just it. won't. Um, you know, so. Uh, and that goes back to the topic of saying, look, this is the correct dial for the correct period with right. the correct range, so that therefore it's a correct watch. Right, exactly, exactly. You know, Rolex, unfortunately, is not forthcoming with their information. They're which, never which gonna issue. sucks, I, I hate that. Uh, I don't think they want the liability. I don't think they want the rushes of people, because they produce a lot of watches. It's not like Patek, where they produce, yeah. you know, a few thousand yeah, a year. Yeah, you can they get produce, archives for Patek, and you start doing that with Rolex, over millions produce, and millions and millions. you know, 400,000 plus watches a year, dating back to the 60s, you know? That's a lot of watches. So, I don't think, they'd have to hire a completely separate department. There'd be a lot of liability. Um, there'd be a lot of it's headaches. A lot of useless, and, you know, I mean, they I guess to them, they, useless work. And I they guess. don't need to. Rolex is a giant for a reason. You know, they, they don't, don't need care. to make money they off archive papers. They don't care. Speaking of Rolex, what do you think of the new models? I like them. 
Exactly. I like them a lot. You know, I uh, people get up in arms because they just change a bezel color and they call it new. Um, but they've been doing what they've been doing since the dawn of time. That's the point. Small, Everything we just showed you. It's small, small, small changes. Tweaks, small tweaks. They made the case a little thinner. I hear it wears a lot better. I haven't had the privilege of trying one on yet. Um, upgrading the movement, which they did, you know, over time, like they do with all these watches. Uh, you know, changing little things here and there to fit the consumer and listen to their clients. The clients wanted a thinner watch, a more accessible uh, wear on the wrist. And apparently, even though the new sub is 41 millimeters and the old sub is 40 millimeters, it wears smaller and more uh, hardy on the wrist. Speaking of, they made another Kermit and I brought something that, that, that website. Yeah, this this has shot up in value tremendously be, i feel like even more i got this before it released before right. i knew they were going to do a new kermit or whatever they, they dubbed it the new kermit right i mean they, i mean i think collectors are dubbing yeah, it the new kermit they, they dubbed it the, new, the new kermit so i have a new old stock kermit in stock Let's uh, take this off. And, I, and i did this oh wow this is new old stock it still has the original case stickers on it yeah, so this is like true, true new old. It's all stickered up. Do you know what the sticker on the back is? That's actually an import sticker from Argentina because they were not allowed to get Rolex stickers imported. So, so let's, let's see if we can put that's that. That's cool. It still even has the class stickers. Wow, that is true new old. So, so with, with that, uh, you know, again, I acquired this and I actually put this up on my website before. You should just stick that in your safe. Look what happened with Hulks. They discontinued it and then the prices shot I think, up. <laughs> I think that's a little nuts. But this is very comparable with the, what they just made, yeah, right? Uh, I mean, obviously. This is not a ceramic bezel and things of that nature. But this just goes to show how new releases can often rate. Now, I still, I still have, the, I priced this pr at 25000 on my website before the new releases came out. And right. now I feel like I can raise the price on it. Well, well you know, I, I mean, I think, yeah, obviously it's, it's a fade that might, you know, start exactly. calming down over time. But the new, the new uh, Kermit, the new LV, uh, people were asking 29000 30000 for them already. So I think for you to have a new old stock one that's we, no we, longer in production, but price not, less, but <laughs> but sounds not, like a not, bargain to me. <laughs> but, we're not, but, we're not, but we know how that goes. Are you? High out of the gate. Right. Now, and, and I've talked about new Rolex releases a year, and it's the same thing. Something new comes out, it shoots really high out of the gate because people want it, they want it yesterday. Right. You, only, you, you only get so much release into the market at the same time once the inventory catches up. But I feel like we're, it's like a new Ferrari. It, but we're in an odd time, right? Because right now, the Rolex market is, new Rolex market is the right. hottest it's ever been in terms of pri the prices of freaking outrageous, right? right. You know, uh, I saw somebody ask 28000 for a new old stock Hulk. Right. And I laughed at it. You know what I mean? Like, but Hulk's, you know, we just sold a Hulk for nineteen five. Right. You know, uh, and this was, an, this was a pre-owned one from right. 2019 or 18. I don't remember what it was. But, you know, the new stuff hype is going to come down, but it may not due to the fact that what's been happening the last year with Rolex prices production, overall and right. production and things of that nature. But Rolex is not, are not the guys that, to cut their production. They're going to catch up. They're going to get their money. Right. You know, whatever production they stopped doing over the last, over COVID and stuff, they will catch up eventually. But it's just crazy how, um, you know, you have a new watch that comes out of the gate and based on what's been going on in the market, how a brand new release can affect the value of an older time Absolutely. piece. And it can doesn't necessarily have to go back to mid-2000s. It can go back down to 70s and 80s and things of that nature. Right. Popularity, and I've told you guys before, popularity is key and it's you guys that drive that market. It's what you like. And I always say buying what you like that I feel drives these, these prices. Uh, yeah, the insane. market's dictated by whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. Um, I think Rolex, you know, and I hate to look at watches. I was actually responding to an email earlier this morning about uh, whether he thought one of the watches on my site was a good investment. And I said, listen, I hate to talk All about day. watches as investments. I really do. You should be buying first and foremost what you like and what oh. you enjoy wearing. I didn't tell him to say that, by the way. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, at least when you're talking about Rolex and some other stable brands like Patek and Audemars, uh, your investment is somewhat protected by market stability. Uh, and markets, so like blue chips. Yeah, you know, uh, yes, prices go up, they go down, but at the end of the day, your your, your twenty thousand dollar Rolex is never going to become five thousand. You know, no. it may become eighteen thousand, it may become twenty two thousand. You know, if you're exactly. lucky, it becomes forty thousand. If I just gave you a choice right now, pay me a thousand dollars a year for the next five years, keep this watch for five years and bring it back, or give me fifty grand cash, what are you going to do? They're going to give me a thousand dollars for a year. Listen, if your watch appreciates and you're able to sell it for more than you paid, it's certainly a bonus and it's great. Um, but at the end of the day, you shouldn't be buying a watch unless you enjoy wearing it. And you like to, you know, when I look down on my wrist, I like to smile. You know, I like to enjoy what I'm wearing. Like you said, it doesn't matter if it's a $200 watch or it's a $5 million watch. Um, it, it's all about, you know, that satisfaction of Speak, wearing Speaking uh, of $5 million, $5 million. Oh, what? did you bring it? Yeah, I did. I did. I watched your video with Bob. That was a great video. No way. Here you go. So listen, I sold... 
uh, two years ago, and I think Bob talked about it on his chat, a Lemon uh, Screwdown Pushers Daytona is one of four known in the world. And I would say this watch might be more special than that. It might be rare. Uh, wow. I don't know if everybody can see. We are talking about the Cherry Dial JPS Daytona. So, uh, I mean, I think Bob covered it in great detail yeah, why this did. watch is but special. But I know you, wanna, you would want to see it, so. But, I yeah, wow. I, I actually stuck it under my desk so you couldn't see it. Wow, look at the condition of this. Yeah, I didn't even ask you about it when yeah. it came to the office. I forgot about it. Wow. Wow, what a special watch, man. So, so what a with, special so, watch. So with, with this, Bob, 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 I'm going to put this on my wrist. Bob likes to shoot for the sky, I guess, in terms of dollars and values. At right. the end, he went from five to six million to all the way up to $10 million. Right. Uh, not a watch I'm going to sell for $10 million or $5 million. I'm right. probably going to sell it for a little bit less. But as you said earlier, you know, kind of watch that, look, it's a needle in a haystack. It you is, know? Absolutely. I, think, I think only four were known. Right. To, uh, in, uh, look, it fits me perfectly. You can wear it for a little bit. Time, you're time to take it home. You, you're insured, right? So, <laughs> so long, long story short, I, I wanted to throw that on Adam's wrist because, you know, nobody out there in the world, as far as I'm concerned, is uh, would appreciate something like that more than Adam being a true, true vintage connoisseur. And as I mentioned earlier, this is a guy, this is my go-to guy, uh, you know. And so when I get into all these intricate little details, I, yeah, I may know 70% of everything that Adam has said about these watches. There's a lot more. We only have so much time in the show. I don't want to keep you guys in here for two hours, but Adam could have brought more watches. We could have brought more watches. But <laughs> at the end of the day, day. <laughs> we can talk all day about this. But at the end of the day, it comes down to a trust factor when it comes to vintage. So when you're out there shopping for vintage, when I'm out there shopping for vintage and actually selling vintage, I always, always tend to go to the expert. I do the same thing with my collectible The same guns. thing with me and modern. When yeah, I have a question, exactly. Call you, and, and, you know? Adam, and Adam does the same thing with modern, whether it's market value, whether a watch being correct or not correct, what it should come wow. with as far as box and papers. But at the end of the day, uh, I would rather not have a sale uh, than to sell something to somebody and then having to go back and stumbling saying, oh, 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 oh. I'd rather know upfront what everything is, disclose all that information to a client that's buying a watch. And that's really the only way to buy vintage watches is to find somebody you trust. Uh, and it works the same way in the deal world, you know, it, not necessarily just the client. Don't jump, out on a ran <laughs> yeah, don't, don't jump out on a random website and click buy it now. Find out, read up about it, talk to people about it, talk to experts, look at auction results. Right. Get as much information as possible so that when you call that dealer, rather than clicking buy it now, ask the right questions. You're educated, yeah. Uh, I you, mean, uh, you know. there's nothing wrong with asking questions, exactly. but you know, at this point in time, you know, there's so much information out there and there's so many people you could go to. Uh, and, I, and I tell people all the time, listen, uh, you know, I'd prefer you not me to use me as an encyclopedia, but absolutely, you know, even if it's not my watch you're considering buying and you're not sure, I'm happy to help when I can, yeah. uh, happy to give you information. Um, Listen, it's it's all makes part of, the community it's a, grow and, it's a, it's and spread, all, it's all spread part, the wealth. It's all, part of, it's all part of the relationship. Absolutely. And, I, and I'll close this off by saying that I'm glad I developed a relationship with Adam from the very first watch which he sold me, which was my Blancpain Aqualong that you guys have seen before. And since that time, I've, deliver, I've, I've developed that relationship, that trust relationship, because it helps me out greatly. And, you know, you guys think, oh, wait a minute, you guys are competitors. And no, it doesn't work that way. Our business is a very small world. And oftentimes we have the type of relationships that we have that helps the both of us out in the long run. Right. Adam, I want to thank you so much for flying Thanks in. Thanks for having me. I'm going to go in the vault and try to sell you some stuff. Now. I'm going to run away with this JPS now. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm insured. Go ahead. Uh, so <laughs> I'm going to go try to sell Adam some things I have downstairs in the vault. Other than that, guys, you know what to do. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button if you're not a subscriber. And as I always ask, share this video if you enjoy the content with your friends because this is what helps my channel grow organically. And perhaps next time we'll do one of these in Florida where yeah. it's nice and warm. Thanks, it Adam. Appreciate it. Thanks, brother.